Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, welcome, Fade to Black. How you doing? How you doing? Let's go. It is Monday, April 22nd, 2024. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, kicking off another week here on Fade to Black. And tonight, Alec Navala Lee is with us. Uh, we're going to be talking about, well, this is a broad, broad subject tonight. But I titled it, ah, I'm not that creative, The History of Sci-Fi. But it's it's a huge subject, and we're going to get into all of that tonight with Alec. Tomorrow night, Taji Amin is with us, a television presenter and reporter and journalist. And we're going to be talking about his new show and a string of UFO incidents in Puerto Rico. That all happened on his watch. We are going to be discussing that tomorrow night with Taji Wednesday night, Robert Wagoner is with us, lucid dreaming. And then Thursday night, she's back with us, Geraldine Orozco. And we're going to be talking about life force mystery. Your life force, right? A mastery mystery. Yeah, that too. <laughs> mastery. Uh, Life Force Mastery with Geraldine Orozco. And uh, there you go. Now, we're... Um, I wanted to mention, uh, we will uh, undoubtedly get into this tonight, but uh, I've watched a couple of times this week. I didn't see it in the theater. Uh, my daughter, Nicole, texted me uh, as she's walking out of the theater, Dad, you got to see Dune 2. Oh, man. Oh, oh, the visuals. And I I meant to see it in the theater. I didn't do it. Uh, didn't get a chance, but uh, I have now watched it on my 100-inch. Right? Okay. I've watched it twice this week, and it's an extraordinary film, and uh, we'll get into that. But if you haven't seen it yet, uh, yes, yes, it is. it is pretty amazing. It's pretty well detailed and completely sets up, by the way, spoiler alert, Dune 3. <laughs> it gets to the end of the film, and I was like, okay, all right, okay, okay. Oh, oh, I see what's going on here. And, uh, yeah, Dune 3, it's already in production, so I'm just letting you know. I don't know how long we're going to have to wait, but uh, check it out. Now, if you haven't seen um, uh, the latest Dune, watch them back-to-back. They they button up pretty nicely together. Tonight, Alec is with us. We're going to discuss all of his research into the history of science fiction. And, of course, the subject that I talk about so much on this show, which is the tech that has come out of science fiction, uh, futurism uh, that has come out of it, and all of the figures that are behind some of these, uh, I'm going to say, predictions of the future that were done with creative writing that just seemed to to happen and we're going to get into all of that tonight he is the author of the biography inventor of the future the visionary life of buckminster fuller and it was named a new york times uh, editor's choice and one of esquire's 50 best biographies of all time his previous book astounding john w campbell isaac Asimov, robert heinlein and l ron hubbard and the golden age of science fiction was also a 2019 hugo award finalist and the economist best book of the year his website uh, we've got it uh, right below over on our website and throughout social media it, the links are below and i would like to welcome for the first time to fade to black 
He's right here, Alec Navalo Lee. Alec, how are you, man? Oh, you're frozen. Oh, can, no. can you hear me? Sorry. Okay. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the link here, uh, the connection here is like a little bit buggy. Um, I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I, I think we should be okay. Okay, all right. Uh, well, the, I started with how you doing, but <laughs> before you say fine, let's get the first time guest disclaimer uh, out of the way, Alec, and every first time guest gets it. Next time you're on the show, you won't, but you get it tonight, which is this. Alec, it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends, and where that conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends, but we're going to end as friends. You have to accept Alec? I'm still here. Yeah, sorry. I, I, said, I said you have to accept. <laughs> okay, no, I, I accept. I accept. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I just mentioned Doom 2, and uh, I, I found it, it was, it was actually great. I, I, I really enjoyed it. But the books, I never thought would, uh, movies could do them justice. This is kind of a rare instance where it has. But when we look at the original Dune series of, of novels, all the way through Children of Dune, you know, the whole thing, um, they're the ideas of folding space and that, time, that type of uh, space travel is something that is being explored and discussed today in physics and science as part of our reality and a look to the future. Is that an example of what science fiction can do to get scientists to think in a certain direction? Well, uh, th that's a good question. Um, so one of the things I've been uh, trying to figure out over the past few years um, is, is, are the claims that science fiction makes for itself true? Okay, because science fiction is unique in terms of genre fiction in that um, it, it, it basically thinks that it can change the world, uh, or at least the lives of individual readers uh, in ways that you don't see mystery fiction or, or, or Western fiction claiming. Okay, you know, it, it, science fiction has a um, tradition of claiming to be predictive, you know, that it, it sort of can foresee where things are going, and also um, of being kind of proactively influencing. Uh, the direction of the future by inspiring people. Um, and I think, you know, you have to take those claims with a grain of salt. I, I think that science fiction has always had um, kind of a inferiority complex when it comes to its status in relation to other kinds of fiction. You know, science fiction writers are very smart. They um, think highly of themselves. And I think they're very conscious that uh, science fiction began, at least in America, as a pulp genre. And so they're always like trying to say, well, you know, we're exceptional. We have, you know, a, a tension. All right. Um, and my conclusion is that I think science fiction's predictive uh, abilities are often, you know, due to chance. There are a lot of stories out there, you know, the vast majority of them don't have any influence or, or special insight into the world, but every now and then there is a story that gets traction or just, you know, simply by chance, by luck, you know, happens to foresee something interesting. Um, more interesting to me is how science fiction influences the lives of its readers. Uh, I, I don't think there's any question that science fiction can be a really formative experience for young people reading those stories, seeing those movies for the first time. So um, people who read Dune, for example, um, have been inspired to enter the sciences. Uh, I, I can talk later about how books like uh, Isaac Asimov's Foundation series influenced people to, you know, become economists and think about, you know, predicting the future. And you can also say that um, they influence the things that science, uh, scientists talk about and, and that they take seriously. I, I think things like space travel and uh, the prospect of, you know, interstellar flight, these are things that we talk about now partly because science fiction told us to, to care about these things. Um, whether that's predictive or influential in other ways, you know, I think is an open question. There's no question that, you know, people that read science fiction went on to live their lives in certain ways that they wouldn't have if they hadn't read those books and seen those movies at, at, at the right time. But, <laughs> here's the but with that. It, it, if it influences life, and the life of somebody that has a, a creative mind, whether it's to run a company or to write great music, right? It, it doesn't really matter. 
that 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 is great. But then there's the other part where if a young creative mind reads something in science fiction and says, "Hey, I want to I want to build that one day." And then it does get built. Is is that the same thing? Or is it taking it one step further where it is predictive? Right. I mean, I mean, th- that's the big question, right? Um, th- there's no question, you know, Isaac Asimov uh, famously said we were, we were living in a science fictional world. Okay. And I think that's true. And I think you could say that um, science fiction came along at the right time. You know, it came along at a time when people were asking these questions and were curious about technology and were worried about the future. You know, uh, the, the big... Uh, golden age for science fiction that I write about in some of my, my, my you know, uh, work as, as a historian and a biographer comes out of the period before World War II, comes out of the Cold War. And, and, you know, the big question is, are these things already in the culture? Are they already happening? And science fiction is responding to them and it's becoming popular because those things are on people's minds. Or is science fiction shaping the direction that the culture takes? And, and it's hard to separate those two things, right? I think both can be true. I think it's true that the world was on a certain trajectory when science fiction took hold um, that made it relevant in ways that it hadn't been a century earlier, let's say. But it's also true that, yeah, people um, are inspired by it. And you know, to me, it's less about the particular ideas as about some of the values of science fiction. The best ones are curiosity and, you know, a um, interest in science, you know, uh, as a way of understanding the world. But, th- you know, they're also uh, kind of oh. technology, right? Oh, okay, you, you locked up for about five seconds. Okay. So just back up. Uh, let's, let's time travel. Let's HG Wells this thing. Uh, back up five seconds. Okay. Um, you know, I, I was saying that, you know, along with the positive side of science fiction, how that influences people, there is like a more ambiguous side where people might try to solve problems through technology, through inventing something um, that might actually be solved in better ways that don't involve, um, you know, sort of the the solutions that science fiction tends to favor. Do you? OK, uh, a couple of quick questions and and then we'll move forward. Uh, what's what do you consider the first science fiction book that was published? Um, I mean, this goes a bit outside my area of direct expertise, but um, Frankenstein is is the answer that I've um, given a lot that I've seen given. I, I think um, you know when I talk to people who publish hard science fiction, they're trying to explain what is science fiction. Frankenstein is a good example. It's a story that could not exist except for a scientific idea. Um, you can go back and find earlier examples, but I think, you know, if you want to like pick one book, that's the one. I'm going the Bible. Wow. I like it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going the Bible. You, I'm you going the Bible. Bible. You want to expand upon that? <laughs> yeah, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going with the Bible. I have talked to, uh, I, two things I don't do in the show, religion and politics, but I will do the conspiracy of religion for sure. And I've had a lot of religious scholars on the show to discuss this very aspect of the Bible, where if you pull out and interchange just a couple of words, you've got Isaac Asimov playing out. I mean, it's just, it's, you've got, uh, you've got your aliens, you've got your craft. Um, You know, if you, if you really think about it, Moses downloaded information from the cloud to a tablet. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you look at it like that and you just start to play with things, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going with the Bible. But if I fast forward and I go to modern history, I kind of lean on H.G. Wells, the time machine, sure. uh, because of its uh, pure science fiction dynamics. But I agree with you. Um uh, Frankenstein couldn't exist without the science that was presented there, for sure. Well, I want to follow up on your Bible, you know, like uh, your claim about the Bible, because uh, it's interesting. Um, so I spent a fair amount of time thinking about the book of Ezekiel, right? And, mm-hmm. and you're probably familiar with the idea that the vision that Ezekiel describes in the first chapter is some kind of spaceship. Um, and uh, it's interesting, right? Because um, 
Analog Magazine, which is uh, formerly known as Astounding. This is the magazine that I, I know best. Uh, I'm going to say in the 60s, actually published a article that was framed as a, as a uh, fiction, like a, like a piece of science fiction, but it was actually written like an essay claiming that the, um, the uh, wheels within wheels and the four beasts of Ezekiel were a record of a, some kind of extraterrestrial um, encounter. And, and it was presented very straight. Um, and I think uh, John Campbell, the editor, felt he had to frame it as a, a, a work of fiction. But, you know, you, you read it and you're like, no, this guy's actually trying to make the case that, you know, whatever Ezekiel saw was something from outer space. Yeah, it, I, I was um, I was 21 when I had my my aha moment with that. And I was uh, I, over the course of a summer, I, 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 it wasn't a religious thing. I just decided to read the Bible so I could have. The knowledge, the foundation, so I could be in a conversation if it's brought up because I knew nothing about it. And so I read it, then I flipped it over and I read it again. And I got about halfway through the second reading. And I'm serious, I'm 21, man. I'm a kid. And I put it, put it down. And I just went, huh. This is close encounters of the third kind. You know, mm -hmm. that's it's, it's like popped in my head. This is science fiction it was just like a weird thing so i started to read it and every time i saw a reference that was of the heavens or otherworldly i just interjected a modern scientific uh, science fiction term and i really enjoyed it <laughs> I really, yeah. I'm, just, I'm being serious too no I, um, I i i totally know where you're coming from um the one thing I want to kind of like um, maybe flag here, we can pick this up later on, is that this ties in a little bit with Scientology, because I've spent a lot of time thinking about the origins of Scientology, which come out of this period in science fiction. Lauren Hubbard was one of Campbell's, uh, you know, famous, famous favorite writers in the 30s. And uh, I'm not an apologist, obviously, for Scientology. But I, I will say people make fun of the material of the Xenu story and the idea that, you know, um, Hubbard is uh, writing about space aliens and these galactic empires. But you know, the reason it seems strange is because it was it was written within living memory, because it's recent, right? Two thousand years from now, it's going to be indistinguishable from a lot of the things that people take as religious, um, like articles of belief. How so? How so? That's interesting. How so? Well, you know, I mean, you think about um, how religions, all religions, start as cults, right? They start as cults. And a cult that lasts for a thousand years becomes a religion, and a cult that lasts for two thousand years becomes Western civilization. Right? Uh, you know, the, these things become more credible because they were around before we were born. And I think um, you look back at the stories in the Bible or you know mythologies from other cultures, and you know they are not. You, you cannot pinpoint any particular way in which they are more credible than what Hubbard wrote. We just happen to know more about where Hubbard was coming from and, and more about him personally, which makes it very hard to take it seriously. But, you know, this is this was equally true of uh, the people who wrote the Bible at the time it was being written. I, I, I'll, I'll just maybe pause there. Well, yes. Yes, I, mean, I would there, agree there, with there's, that. There's, there is one difference. Okay, the difference is that Hubbard is um, clearly using this material to exploit people in obvious ways. You could say the same is true of some religions, um, but you know, in, in his case, it's more obvious, more blatant. I, I would say than it is for a lot of other people who have founded religions and, and claim to have, you know, some kind of insight into into the way the world is. Um, I it, it's weird for me. Um, I Scientology is. I almost don't like saying the word, right? Because it. It, it first off, it flags systems. That's number one, right? There are search algorithms looking for people talking about it. Sure. But the, the other part is I did a fair amount of uh, reading and, and, and interest in Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard, uh, they, they gave me uh, one of his books, uh, Scientology did, and uh, which I have. And uh, and I started finding out, and I thought to myself, at what point does a Scientologist or somebody that has an interest in it gets exposed to the other part, right? Right, and and are they okay with it? 
and do they understand? Or is it just about self-improvement and that's the main thing that they're concerned about and the science fiction stuff and the off planet and the return and, and all of that is, is not of consequence. Well, yes. I mean, this is a good point too, right? Where there are people who are uh, Christians, let's say, say mm. some of those stories. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I'm not a Scientologist. My experience with it firsthand is limited. But I do wonder because um, I have talked to people who are very, um, you know, I mean, adamant that Scientology changed their lives. And, and I think if you go back, you can see that auditing this therapy that Hubbard uh, developed. It, 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 for some people, it was beneficial. Okay. And I think I have to separate that from the other stuff. I guess there's the sort of the exploitative side of Scientology. And then there's like the kind of space opera side. And I'm sure there are people who benefit and or benefited in the past enormously from the therapeutic side, whether or not you can detach that from the other two elements of, of that religion is a, a different story. I used to, and we'll move on from Scientology. In the 80s, I lived I literally across the street uh, on Franklin from their, what do they call it, the celebration, this glorious converted hotel yeah. on Franklin. And uh, uh, I lived on that corner. And so, uh, and I lived on the top floor of the apartment building that's on the corner there next to the liquor store, overlooking, so I could look into the courtyard over the fences. The fences, you can't, you know, when you're driving on the street, you can't see in. But but anyway, so I lived up on top, and I watched these parties, right? The limousines and a full orchestra out on the grass and and the tuxedo and the, the, the glamour. I was like, man. That looks like a lot of fun. I don't know what's going on down there, but they are doing it right. And yeah, yeah, it had a had a big influence on me to watch that kind of pageantry. It was uh, uh, upper crust for sure. Do you have a favorite uh, writer that that you that you gravitate towards first? Um, Heinlein. Um, so. Um, mm -hmm. So just as you know, for sure. So the background here is that when I wrote my book, Astounding, which is about the Campbell period in science fiction, uh, I read a lot of fiction. I, I read a lot of those stories for the first time. And um, Heinlein to me stood head and shoulders above the, the rest. Uh, you know, the, a lot of the stories from that magazine and the pulp era are not that great. You know, they are forgotten for a reason. And, you know, they, they were not meant to be enduring. They, they were written quickly, usually just one or two drafts. Um, and it shows, right? They're, they're the, the stories aren't, aren't great. Um, Heinlein, from the beginning, I think, was the best writer in the genre, uh, just technically. I think he had some of the best ideas, and he had the widest range. Um, so, yeah, I mean, really early on, uh, he was, I think, the best. I think Campbell recognized that. I think he was kind of um, seen as, as the best they had to offer early on. And so he's probably the one where... Um, I've read nearly all of his fiction up to a certain point. Um, you know, probably the person who, that I'm the most impressed by, just on every level. You know, in terms of what science fiction from that period can do. Uh, the uh, for me, and we were talking about this er er earlier. I mean, Arthur C. Clarke, but uh, Heinlein is is so far up there, and so is Asimov. Uh, and and Philip K. Dick, uh, Philip K. Dick, uh, really started to freak me out because he was so outside of the box and and yet a futurist too. Are you there? Yeah, you're freezing. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we're frozen. We are frozen, everybody. Okay, I'm back. I, I don't know okay. if you can hear me or not. Okay, I can hear you. Your your video is frozen. So what I what I was saying was that Philip K. Dick was uh, a futurist, but completely outside of the box. Yeah. Uh, sorry, who are you talking about? Uh, who's outside the of the Philip, box? Philip yeah. K. Dick. So I was going to say um, the writer from the period I know best, who reminds me the most of Dick, is uh, E. Van Vogt. I don't know if you've read Van Vogt. Um, but he is wild. 
Um, Dick was a huge fan. You can see the influence of vote and votes work on Dick very clearly. And um, this is stuff. Oh man. It's, it's remarkable. Like how weird that stuff was allowed to be, you know, that early on in, in the magazine. Uh, Phil, did, did you see the presentation that Philip K. Dick did in France when he spoke to the audience? It was a conference, and he spoke through a translator. Did, did, did you ever see that press conference? I don't think I've seen that. He tells, this is 1970, I'm going to go with 77, but it's right in there, 75, 76, 77. Through a translator, he's got a room full of, uh, I'm going to softly estimate, say 500 people, it's packed. And he tells the crowd through a translator that they're living probably in an alternate reality. And that is not really him. And he did it. Now, now the, the audience is in shock. The way that Philip K. Dick presents it, uh, is pretty convincing. But then when we move forward to today in 2024, this is like an everyday conversation about alternate realities. Mm -hmm. But Philip K. Dick firmly believed that he was in an alternate reality. Of course, he wrote about it a lot. But to say it publicly like that at a conference uh, was was pretty amazing for 1977. Yeah, no, I, I definitely read, um, he's written essays about this, you know, th that are fascinating. And yeah, that, that whole premise is very, to me, it, it's very Van Vogt. Um, I, I think um, the, the idea that the world is different from what we think it is, um, is a, a hugely important thread in science fiction. And, and you can trace it back to, to some of those earlier stories. Now, uh, when we look at where we are uh, today, satellites, the talk of space elevators, of course, uh, traveling to the moon, and we're on our way to Mars. Um, do, do you see uh, a future that we are in now, the, the future that we arrived to, I should say, um, was completely out of suggestion that we always wanted to go to the moon? We always wanted to explore space and go out uh, to the stars, so it was inevitable? Or were the processes very much like the science fiction writers presented, like Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke? Well, you know, I, I, I think that the idea that space travel is part of mankind's destiny, that it's like this inevitable progression. I, I, I don't know if we would even, um, I mean, the moon is an obvious, uh, you know, object of fantasy. Um, I don't know real if science fiction writers hadn't given us the idea. Um, and, you know, you look at someone like Elon Musk, for example, who is, you know, in some ways like a Heinlein character, for better or for worse, uh, you know, in real life. Um, clearly someone who read these stories growing up and was influenced by them and whose ideas about what, you know, we should be doing as a species are, are hugely shaped by, by the stories he read growing up. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, we can debate, you know, and I think Musk especially is a good case study and why it can be a little bit dangerous to try to enact some of those science fiction uh, stories in, in real life. Now, uh, let's talk about the three laws of robotics. And of course, you know, the Foundation series is always brought up uh, when the subject uh, is, is brought up, but we are clearly in a robotic world now, uh, something that I, I don't, it, it's coming up a little bit too fast for us. I think we're getting ahead of our skis, but this is something that these basic laws were written in science fiction. Yeah. So um, the three laws to me are interesting because Obviously, you know, Asimov is the one we associate with those ideas. But, you know, it's actually Campbell, his editor, who came up with the, the three laws as we know them now. They, they came up out of these conversations that Campbell and Asimov had, uh, you know, about the robot stories. And, um, you know, the, I don't know how seriously those, those three laws were taken in actual AI research. Okay, this is something I've wanted, I've been curious about for a long time. Because if you look at the original iRobot stories, the whole point of the, the three laws is that they are incomplete, you know, that they are subject to 
misinterpretation or, or to um, these loopholes that cause uh, robots to behave in strange ways. You know, they are, they're, they're only, those stories are only interesting because Asimov can think of exceptions. They can, he can think of ways in which, you know, these three laws aren't as, as obvious or as clear cut as they seem. So, you know, people tend to forget this. You know, it's like th these, are, these are laws that were invented for works of fiction because they were useful when they broke down. You know, they were more interesting when they failed to anticipate, you know, certain um, unexpected behaviors or situations, um, you know, that these robots end up in. Isn't it because we want to feel safe, right? I mean, law, right, where we don't get, you know, too freaked out. Law one is no robot should harm humans or allow a human to be harmed. If I got it right, right. I might be paraphr paraphrasing. But it, don't we need that comfort zone? Okay, frozen again. Okay, Alec? Oh, I'm back, sorry. Um, so I, I want to piggyback on what you said about the first law, okay, about it, how it's meant to make us feel safer. So um, later on, Asimov comes up with uh, what he calls the zeroth law, all right, which is that a robot cannot uh, allow uh, mankind to come to harm or, or through you know, inactivity allow mankind as a whole to come to harm. Um, and that, you know, to me is interesting because um, the, def the definition of harm is very, um, you know, it it's slippery, right? I mean, when it comes to one person, it seems clear cut. It's less clear cut when it comes when it comes to people as a whole. And you have stories that explore what happens when the, the robots think they know what is best for us. You know, this this kind of ties in with um, what later on becomes, you know, worries about AI, the singularity, you know, the idea that we are unleashing these forces that we can't control. Even a, a robot intelligence that is essentially benevolent might decide on our behalf that certain things are bad for us. Um, there's a really great story called With Folded Hands by Jack Williamson that explores some of these ideas where essentially human beings, they're lobotomized um, because the robots are concerned that they're going to hurt themselves. And so they take away our, our free will. They take away our agency because they know that we'll destructive ways. Um, so yeah, so so even like the law that seems the most clear cut, you know, can be twisted, um, at least in fiction, and maybe in real life, um, in ways that are actually pretty frightening. And the, the second law um, pertains to you can't have your, your Terminator T-1000 harm another human. You can't order it to hurt another human or that you know robots must obey any orders given to it by a human being unless it conflicts with the first law okay yeah that's it yeah i my, my brain is 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 60 years old so but yeah. but yeah yeah exactly exactly well but you know i mean i mean that, and that law is interesting too because um you know I, one of my friends is, is annalee new a really great science fiction writer who points out that you know the three laws they are essentially laws for slaves you know, like robots are not given any choice in the matter, right? And, and so there's something a little bit disturbing, you know, when you see it. And, and again, this is this is not this is inherent in the stories. You see things from the robots' point of view. You know, what rights do robots have? What what, what rights do does non-human intelligence have if we grant that these things are are intelligent? Well, if they if they become sentient, like truly sentient there will have to be legislation, right? You won't be able yeah. to come home and kick your Roomba. Well, you know, uh, so, so Westworld, a show that, you know, I think was flawed in other ways, um, you know, was, represented a pretty interesting attempt to, to grapple with some of those questions. I'm not saying it was entirely successful, but, you know, that show was interesting because it said this is about the emergence of a new form of life, right? And, and, and what does it mean when, you know, this form of life that we've created um, you know, it has questions about the role that it's it's meant to play in, in the world. Um, and again, the show, it, it was almost like too much for one show to cover. But I, I had to admire the way it, it asked those questions and, and tried to find interesting answers. And but the third law for me is the mysterious one that a robot should have the right to protect its itself. Right. And that now it's like, wait a minute, that you can't 
it's like it goes back against law number two and law number one because law number three almost supersedes law number two and certainly supersedes law number one. Well, but it says, you know, the robot can protect its own existence as long as it does not conflict with laws one and two. So again, it's that, that you have to, that, that's why it's in there, right? right? Because it does conflict with the other two. And, and there's, so you've got the, the asterisk, you've got the disclaimer there, Yeah. but certainly it, it, you're going to, uh, 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 the, the circuits would fry out right in, in the, in the paradox. Right. And, um, and again, like a lot of the stories, you know, they're only interesting because of the third law, right? Because the first two, they kind of work, you know, they, they don't seem to, to pose obvious problems. But when you bring the third law, robots make strange choices. You know, what they see as like, is, you know, what it means to protect themselves and to also obey orders. Um, so, yeah. So, again, like they are, they are, they are trickier to, to parse than they might seem at first but that, that's part of the point they're meant to seem very straightforward they're meant to seem like things that a rational robot builder would want to hardwire into you know th this creation but then you realize no you know real life uh, or at least as portrayed in those stories it's it's complicated it's surprising in ways that we can't expect are you um are you alarmed with uh the pace of ai today um th that's a great question um I, I I think I am alarmed by it in the same way I'm alarmed by a lot of debates over technology. You know, the, who gets to um, decide these things and, and what kind of solutions we kind of, um, you know, we, we can imagine, right? Because I think um, it's part of like this category of wicked problems like climate change and other, other things where, you know, these are te technological problems <laughs> that then technology is supposed to to solve. And, and I think that is a, that is a mistake. I, I think that um, the debate and the solutions need to be broader than that and less dominated by the people who are invested in them, right? I mean, I, I find um, this debate over AI being like, you know, we're, we're so afraid that these things might take over the world. So we're going to work really hard to build them so that we know how they work. You know, that, that, that seems to be here, which I, I find hard to understand. I, I, I kind of find the, the rush to... Um, to build things where we haven't really talked about the consequences collectively to be troubling. It's not so much about the actual implications because I think the technology the jury is very much still out, you know, how, how useful this stuff is actually going to be. Um, but, you know, the way the, the conversation is, is, is already uh, unfolding to me is not super productive. I, I, I have been pulled to the side many times by some of the brightest and whispered in my ear, hey, man, don't worry about AI. It's it's not in our lifetime. It's 50 years out, maybe 100. It, a, 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 a artificial general intelligence may never be achievable. Yeah. Don't, don't trip. Then I get somebody else in my ear. Dude, you should see what we're working on. It's the craziest thing ever. The singularity is going to happen in six months. You know, yeah. it, it's it's just like I, I I don't know which side of the fence, but the the other part of it is nobody really is in control. What is driving AI yeah. is money, right? And that's that's when you have corporations going, we need to be first, spend all you want, right? <laughs> that's that's well, so, so when I think of the singularity, I, I don't know um, if you've read the book uh, called "The Singularity Is Near" by Ray Kurzweil. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, right, came out about twenty years yeah. ago now. And um, mm -hmm. when I read it, I, I thought it was actually really exciting. I, I, I thought, um... mm -hmm. to him, this For is okay. You froze again. Well, yeah. I, do you have something running in the background? No, it's just um, I'm I'm uh, not at my usual Wi-Fi uh, you know spot, so it's just a little bit buggy. So I'll try to power. Okay, it okay. Um, but so um, you uh, you said that it was exciting when you read it. Yeah, and, and you know, Kurtzwheel is clearly pro singularity, right? He thinks it's going to be the solution to all our problems, including the, the problem that we are going to die, right? That's, that's kind of his big big deal that that the future that that the um, the life extension right is is going to be one of the the consequences of the singularity to the point where we, you know, won't have to die until we feel like.
you know, I mean, at the time I thought that was very compelling. Um, but you know, like, uh, there's, there's the, the, the zero with law, right? Like what does the ultimate godlike AI think is best for us? You know, what, what, what are its priorities? Um, and you know, it, extending Ray Kurzweil's lifespan or mine might not be a priority for, for an AI that is, you know, capable of the things that, you know, we imagine it, it could be able to do. Well, I, I think the other part, uh, and Ray at least brought it up when not too many people were talking about it. You know, I know Jacques Vallée really well, and he was working on AI algorithms in 1969, 1968. And, and so this is, this is nothing new to the inside of Silicon Valley and what's going on up there. But uh, to that end, where Ray has got it wrong I don't think it's going to happen that way. I think that the race first, the easier way around all of this is to get the, the human brain computer interface correct so you can up and download what you need off of the human brain. And through that experimentation, does the soul... Right? Does your consciousness deliver to the hard drive when you download everything onto um, some type of memory device? That's that's the key because I think that overcomes the the sentient issue and where consciousness lies. Is it ones and zeros, or does it exist outside of the body? Well, you know, one thing I like to point out about some of these ideas is that you know they aren't new. Okay, so the idea that a technology is accelerating, you know, that there's this like kind of, um, you know, uh, exponential increase in technology that will lead to things like mortality is, you know, it goes back to the 30s, at least 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, like uh, Buckminster Fuller, you know, the, the you know, futurists that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, they, they, they draw the same graphs that Kurtzwill does, you know, where you, you see this idea that, um, like, because of Moore's Law and like other things, you know, we're advancing so fast that eventually we're going to reach this, um, you know, transcendental point, you know, like, it's always five years away. Right, it's always ten years away. The, the idea is that whoever is making this prediction expects to see it happen during their lifetime. Um, you know, Campbell, who died in 1971, thought he was going to live forever because you know he thought it was going to happen. You know, like while he was still around. And you know, Kurtz Wheel was saying it 20 years ago. Maybe at the moment it seems a little bit more plausible because AI is kind of you know huge, a huge part of the conversation right now. But um, yeah, no, it, it always seems like just out of reach. It, it's, it's always like just around the corner. And uh, is it because the live forever aspect of it uh, the, uh, to solve mortality is because if you are existing in a Tron type of environment, there's no sleep, no food, no disease, and those physical things that uh, hold us back, I, uh, and we understand all of those, but the other consequence of that is living forever it kind of sucks yeah i mean how do how do you how do you occupy your your brain for infinity well i mean this is true of any any conception of immortality right and we're talking about right. like the parallels between science fiction and religion you know the the And the idea of, of death itself, you know, when you think about what that would do to, you know, how, how, how little prepared we are, you know, how, how, how ill prepared our brains would be to, to deal with that kind of existence. Would it be just, I like to learn, right? So it sounds like I would do nothing but go back to college forever, right? <laughs> just right. read and just acquire knowledge. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, I'm very similar in some ways, but I'm like, you know, a thousand years would be great, but do I want a hundred million years? You know, uh, I, I don't know. Like, like the, the, the more you work out those implications, the, the more you're like, well, I, I don't know what, the, what I want, or I, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah. I can't tell if you're freezing or not. It's, no, it's I, weird. I, 
I'm just thinking. I'm, I'm just contemplating. Yeah, yeah. You're just. <laughs> yeah. It, the, and uh, let's uh, let's talk about another aspect of this. When science fiction discusses this, and then we hear the heads of corporations from Elon Musk on down, very large corporations that um, employ thousands, if not tens of thousands of people, very bright individuals, suggest that we're living in an augmented reality and the percentage of it being real are uh, close to a hundred percent. And then the other part about living forever and, and downloading or uploading, I should say their consciousness. It seems like they know something we don't. And is it because Buckminster Fuller and others got into the heads of these Silicon Valley engineers. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Like, I often wonder whether we're living in a simulation. Um, I, I don't know the answer. But, you know, I think that is a, um, it's a prospect that appeals to certain people, right? I, I think the idea that reality is just an extension of technology, or that we can think of it as an advanced version of, you know, a video game or, or simulations that we, we've built, you know, it's, it's kind of seductive. You know, it, it's the idea that, you know, maybe the, the things that about reality that seem inexplicable are actually because it's, it's not what it seems to be, but in ways that we can, can understand. Um, so I'm always like wary of that 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 hypothesis because in some ways I think it's it's almost like taking the easy way out. I, I think it um, raises as many questions as or it avoids as many questions as it answers. If if we think that you know that that scenario is true. Um, are you familiar with Oumuamua? Oops, sorry, uh, I mean. Are you familiar with Oumuamua? Uh, no, no, I'm not. Okay. Uh, I'll give you the 15-second elevator version. Oumuamua, it's a Hawaiian name, uh, was the first interstellar object to visit our solar system. Okay. It happened back in two October of 2017. Um, Avi Loeb... Uh, from Harvard University, wrote a great book called Extraterrestrial, um, and I would I would suggest reading it. It's a it's an amazing book. But anyway, Oumuamua was Rama, right? It, it, the 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 whole as as Oumuamua is unfolding. I mean, the Rama series of books. I've read all of them multiple times in order, right? Just went back and started with with Rama, Gardens of Rama, then Rama 2, and just just pounded through it and started over again. And Oumuamua happens in 2017, and that's exactly the Rama books, except we didn't fly out to it and, and board the craft and, and, and then depart space. But it did buzz by Earth, turn and increase speed and left the solar system at over 270,000 miles per hour. It was just an extraordinary thing. And it's just like, this is exactly how Arthur C. Clarke said it would happen. Yeah. Tracked, followed, departed. It was, it was pretty crazy. It was pretty crazy. Yeah. And the, the reason why I'm bringing it up, well, I was hoping that you were familiar with the well, story. Well, I hadn't, uh, you know, I've, I've forgotten the the name when you said it, but yes, I I, I remember, you know, reading about this, um, you know, when when it, when it happened. And uh, the the reason why is today the questions of contact in UFOs going down with the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, the Senate, the House. Uh, the media, uh, the New York Times, it's all over the place. And now we have the James Webb Space Telescope and, mm -hmm. and exoplanets and everything that is going on. 
And it seems like going back to 2001 and 2010 uh, and other science fiction work of the past is we now are in that era of uh, true contact and possible disclosure. How does that make you feel? Um, well, uh, let's talk about the Rama books. Okay. Cause I think, um, I, I've only read the first two. Uh, I read, actually enjoyed Rama two a lot. Uh, like, I like it more in some ways than the first one. Um, because it does capture something of the uncanniness of what that encounter would be like, you know, I, I don't remember how the series ends, but you know, the first book just raises all these questions that are never answered. We don't know what the plan is or what the Ramans are doing, right? You know, it, it is this inexplicable thing that sort of just passes through our solar system and then goes away. And I think that's kind of how it would be, right? It, it would just, it would just be so strange and so, you know, kind of beyond our our means of comprehension. That um, you know, I mean, Clark was good at this. You know, we talked uh, before. You know, this this uh, you know uh, show started about two thousand and one, and the idea that you know there there are stranger, bigger things than we can understand. And if we encounter a species that is, you know, millions of years older than we are, it, it it'll be you know like like having a, like a conversation with like like a, an insect. Right, there's no way that's going to be a two-way conversation, and I think um, you know those books, Clark's books especially. You know, he was really good at kind of conveying how dislocating that whole experience would be. Yeah, what uh, what he ends up doing in Rama, and we can move on. Uh, how it ends up playing out, we populate Rama. Okay. Okay. And uh, and so it turns out to be a serious generational colony ship. We populate it, and then uh, by the time uh, when the ship arrives at a, a at a giant uh, um, truck stop full of other Ramas that are arriving from around the universe. Okay, so just imagine the size of that. Rama's already, what, 50 kilometers long? And so it arrives there. But by the time it gets there, you're already at uh, great-great-grandchildren are now running Rama. All of the original cast and crew, <laughs> they've been gone for 500 years. Um, but uh, that seems like a, a real possibility. Uh, 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 same thing with like Valerian, by the way, Luc Besson, uh, I think is also very realistic. Interesting. I've, I've not seen that one actually. Uh, I'm, I, I, I missed it. High on the list. Okay. High, high, you're, you're, high, you're, high. you're the first person I've heard say that. You know, it got very mixed reviews when it, when it came out. You know, look, um, uh, people, people want what they want. Valerian isn't the the Joseph Campbell hero's journey. You, you know, it's just not your typical thing. Um, and it sets up really strange, but for me, man, it, it just played. No, it, it, it plays well. It was not lazy writing at all. It was, it was really good. Luc Besson is good at everything that he's ever attempted. But uh, if you understand Luke and you see the movie, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's really well done. So, yeah, I read the same bad reviews. I remember when I first saw it, Alec, I didn't know anything about it. So I didn't have the bad reviews to pollute my head. I just watched the movie and then watched it again. Then I went and read the reviews. I was like, huh? <laughs> did you guys even see the same movie that I did? I think it was awesome. So, yeah, yeah, I play it for guests all the time when they come over to my house because I know that they've never seen it. <laughs> it's just like one of those. Well, you know, I mean, I, I can't speak to that movie, which I haven't seen, but I, I will say, you know, I, I mentioned 2001. You, you go back and read the original reviews of that movie that appeared in science fiction magazines, and people hated it. You know, it was, it was, it was, you know, an incredibly controversial movie in the fandom because they thought it was pretentious. They thought it was confusing. You know, they, they much rather see Destination Moon or something more straightforward, you know, because yeah, they, they, they didn't quite, I mean, I won't say they didn't understand it because they were smart people, but they, they didn't accept it. They, they, they weren't interested in this, this particular kind of story that, that Kubrick and Clark were trying to tell. Yeah. You know, 20 minutes with no speaking at the beginning of the movie, that's tough. 
Then you have the intermission, right? That's another tough thing. Yeah. And uh, then you got the wackiest ending of all. And the wackiest ending happened because they didn't have a way to end it. They didn't. So yeah, well, they, took the, they took the cheesy way out. Let's just let the viewer write their own ending. You know, it's, it's well, like, you know, it, but but it comes out of what I was saying with, with Clark, right? This ambition, you know, this attempt to like find the, you know, to express the inexpressible. You know, like uh, Kubrick, uh, I know, tried all kinds of ways to visualize the aliens. You know, they they they, they really wanted to show the aliens at the end, and, and they couldn't do it. And, and I think I, th I think it's the right call. I think anything would have been unsatisfying, but it just shows like yeah, like. Um, there, there are some things you can't depict um, and some people find it frustrating, you know, for obvious reasons, but, you know, it, it comes out of like the nature of that kind of story. I, I, I think, I think Clark especially is someone who was always grasping for something that um, fiction, whether filmed or, or written, you know, just couldn't, couldn't convey. Now, what about uh, let's, let's jump ahead to today. Um, when we look at something like arrival, very interesting take on that too, and and when I left, uh, now I know that this isn't a, a book, and we'll talk more about writers uh, when we come back. But Arrival took a whole other approach too, which was uh, communication and how we would have to work together to interpolate, not necessarily transcribe, right, but to interpolate. Uh, the written word and how communication is established. Yeah, that I thought that that was a very interesting take on it. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that linguists uh, love that movie. You know, I, I think they, they think it really captures something about their field that um, you know they haven't seen. There aren't that many good movies about linguistics, but uh, you know that one I think qualifies. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I love that movie. The original story by Ted Chiang, who I know a little bit, is fantastic. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, I think that is a great example. And in some ways, you know, like I talk about like the inexpressible and how 2001 was frustrating because it was trying to do something that might be impossible in film. Arrival understands film, right? And that story works beautifully on film because it uses things like nonlinear storytelling and, you know, foreshadowing in ways that uh, movies can. Um, I think that's, that's a great uh, marriage of subject with medium. Because you know it, it does inspire and kind of get at this uncanny, you know, inexpressible, um, you know, kind of kind of story, but with human characters, right? Which Kubrick doesn't really do, um, you know. And, and I think you know I, I give Arrival a lot of credit for for telling a human story with that kind of background and, and those those ambitions. When when I walked out of Arrival, I remember walking across the parking lot, and I just thought to myself. Uh, you know, outside of the theater, huh? Somebody knows something. This is too well written, right? It was just like right. so well done that it seems like we are being presented with an issue that is is coming down the line. Yeah, and we we need to stop and and try to figure this out now because this is going to happen and we are going to have a communication issue. Reminds me of that movie Bill Murray, right? Uh, Lost in translation, yeah, right. And we can't have that. Yeah, no, I mean uh, these things are useful whether or not you think we're actually going to end up, you know, having some kind of first contact uh, experience. You know, these things are useful as metaphors. You know, these are problems that are. Uh, hard to get your head around, right? And, and the ways that we... Very complicated. Maybe we can get some ideas and some insights into how to approach them from you know a, a story like that. Uh, we're going to take a break right here. So let's get our break in, our guest tonight. Hey, listen, uh, while we are gone, uh, why don't you do a reboot? Okay, I'll do that right now. Hopefully we'll get a little bit less buggy um, when we come back. Our guest, Alec Navala Lee. We are talking about the history of science fiction. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back.
Subscribe to our YouTube channel, get your alerts, and access to over 2,000 videos. Click that subscribe button right now. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and get the Fade to Black official podcast. 2,000 episodes, all of them commercial free for just $2 a month. This is Jimmy Church. Please visit and explore Egypt this October 3rd through the 14th, 2024 with Billy, Elizabeth, myself, and very special guest and the number one podcaster in the world, Sean Kelly. It's simple to do. Just go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com and click on Upcoming Tours or click on the link below. We'll see you there. Watch Into the Vortex on Gaia TV. It's fade to black for the screen. Simple to do. Go to Gaia.com, search Jimmy Church, or click on the link below. Follow Fade to Black on Twitter at J Church Radio. Get all of the show updates every single day. It's it, it's now called X, but who cares? How you doing? Jimmy Church here. Special announcement. Get your Fade to Black t-shirts. That's right. Help support the show. Help support everything that we do over here. We've got two t-shirts. We've got two ways to get them. And right now, if you get a Game Changer membership for a limited time, you will get Fade to Black Blend Coffee with your Game Changer membership. That's right. We have two t-shirts. We have the original, the classic Fade to Black t-shirt. You know you want one. Post a picture. Send it to us. We'll put it in our Fade to Black gallery. And we've got the new official Fade to Black t-shirt drawn by Michael Oming. Two t-shirts, two ways to get them. Get yours today. Everything is in stock. Everything gets autographed. Everything includes shipping, and you're going to get a tracking number. And with the Game Changer membership, you get an email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads of the show. Those are uploaded every single night after the show to the website. So don't delay. Get your Fade to Black t-shirt today. Go Backley Tappy. Go to JimmyChurchRadio.com and become a fade or not. Get a membership. That's right. Everything is commercial free. You have access to downloads and you get to call yourself a fade or not. 
River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right, welcome back, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church, and tonight, our guest, Alec Navala Lee. And we are talking about the history of science fiction. And Alec, um, uh, I'm going to change gears just a little bit, but there's nobody better to ask than you. Um, I read a lot of science fiction. I grew up reading a lot of science fiction. I I watch every, I've I've gone to the end of the science fiction internet. There's nothing left for me uh, to watch. And now, uh, but when I go back and find out the history and the biographies of my favorite writers, I have found that not all, but most are completely troubled individuals. <laughs> is is that what it takes? to expand the mind and and write great science fiction it seems like everybody's got a pretty 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 troubled and dark past yeah there's a pattern here right and um i've noticed this too i, I seem to be drawn to certain types um and I, I thought a lot about whether there's a connection as you say um so i'll, I'll start with campbell so john w campbell is uh, kind of the, the the person i've spent the most time thinking about it was editor of science fiction, uh, the science fiction magazine, astounding, uh, you know, during its its most important period. And, um, you know, Campbell, you know, hugely influential figure, I think a genius in many ways, um, did more than anyone else. And people like Isaac Asimov would, would agree to shape complicated person. You know, he, he was racist. Uh, he was involved with... Um, you know, some strange things uh, with Hubbard, first of all, in uh, developing some of the ideas that later became uh, Scientology, and then later getting into, um, you know, weird areas of the paranormal, psychic powers, um, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, still a very controversial figure. Um, and I, I've come to realize you really can't separate, you know, sort of the positive and the negative. sense that he wanted to be a great inventor. He, he wanted to sort of make his mark. And when he um, found that, you know, that wasn't going to happen, he turned to science fiction, kind of became his um, his outlet, his, his medium for um, trying to produce some of the changes that he, he wanted to see. And on the fiction side, it was great. You know, it it produced you know the three laws of robotics and the foundation series and a lot of Heinlein's you know most famous uh, stories, but it also led indirectly uh, to Scientology, um, and you know I, I think it comes out of this this sort of um, uh, attitude towards the world. You know, the idea that you are the protagonist, you are the hero of your your story in the way that these writers. Um, wrote uh, stories about uh, these these pulp heroes, you know, they kind of saw themselves in the same light. And I think one lesson of Campbell's life and of Hubbard's life especially is that when you try to do that for real outside the realm of fiction, the results can be really uh, like unexpected. You know, they can be really um, troubling. Um, you know, they can have huge emotional and personal consequences. And, and I think, um, you know, the tragedy of some of these uh, writers' lives comes out of that inability to writer and the things you can do in the, the real world. And is it also because, and we'll continue uh, with other writers too, um, but is it because it's the romantic side of science fiction? 
right? That we all want to do those things. And I don't say romantic in a romantic way. I'm saying romantic in a, in a, uh, uh, adventure way that it, it's easy for the theater of the mind to play out. And so we can put ourselves in those roles. So therefore science fiction will always be there for us because it's such, such a fun thing to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I always talk about the, um, that science fiction came out of the pulps, all right? And, and Campbell's genius, I think, was to say, okay, um, science fiction, which had existed in the pulps before he came along, you know, it has a certain kind of hero, all right? You know, this was a hero that was inspired by a heroic, masculine, um, proactive figure, right? Who we respond to you know we kind of want to see ourselves as as someone who can solve problems and you know like take the initiative and um and and, and save the day um and in campbell's case he said we're going to keep that hero but he's going to use science he's going to use engineering to solve problems and we're going to turn you know this um this pulp hero into not just like something that you can use for escapism, you know, but as a role model, as as a exemplar for the kinds of people that we want to see in real life. Okay. Which on, on the one hand, you know, I think it worked. I think it inspired a lot of people to become scientists, you know, in a way that people, you know, never read Western fiction and, and became cowboys, but a lot of people read science fiction and became scientists. So it was inspiring in that way. But, you know, the, the way that stories work, the way that problems are solved in stories, doesn't always correspond to how they're solved in real life, okay? And I think, um, you know, Campbell kind of forgot this. And I think he tried to do, you know, especially with Hubbard, you know, you look at uh, Dianetics and, and the ideas that they were trying to popularize. You know, th these are ideas that were already in science fiction that worked really well, you know, in, in these stories. And then you apply them um, to actual people and say, okay, this is how we're going to, you know, like save the world from the threat of nuclear war. And you end up with something really um, distorted. You know, Scientology to me is kind of like the 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 dark side of the um, ideals of science fiction from that period. And, and it's what happens when you kind of confuse the um, hero and like the convention. Okay, yeah, you dropped out for about 15 seconds. Oh, it's, no, really? Uh, oh. Uh, so it was right around uh, the trouble with Dianetics and the way that science fiction is interpreted. Yeah. So, you know, so, so I'm sorry that that happened. Um, so, so the short version is that um, the, the idea of like a science of the mind. Okay, let, let's take that example. This is something that comes up in science fiction from, I would say, the 30s onward. You know, the idea that you can reduce psychology to an exact science. You know, the three laws of robotics kind of come out of this. Psychohistory, you know, to some extent, comes out of this. And, you know, th these are great premises to base a story on, okay? Because it's really exciting to say, okay, here are some rules that we can use and set up and kind of play with, you know, in fiction in, in surprising ways. You know, approach uh, the brain as if it's a machine with certain rules. You know, um, that therapy for some people was very beneficial, um, but you know, th there are limits to to how useful it can be. You know, because the brain is not a, a computer, um, and there aren't really good rules for human behavior. And, and to think that you can reduce human behavior to these rules in the real world, you know, leads to like weird consequences. You know, if you, if you take that line of reasoning, you know, far enough. Now, uh, with with where we are today, and I find this very interesting, that the science fiction has gotten so good, whether it's Rebel Moon or if anything Marvel, or uh, where it is so great that they obviously are consulting with 
uh, physicist, scientist, theoretical physicist um, to to get these storylines right with uh, dimensions and entanglement and the multiverse and quantum science. Uh, it's it's a pretty good way of educating the public that would never be familiar with, uh, like the movie Interstellar, and and Kip Thorne and his interaction with that from the beginning, uh, which goes back twenty years in development on that film, that the public is now introduced uh, to science in a very realistic way, aren't they? Yeah, no, I mean I think Interstellar is a great example of that. Um, I think. You know, I think audiences um, have come to expect a certain level of, uh, I mean, uh, this is not true of every movie, obviously, but, but someone like Chris Nolan, you know, has set the bar very high, you know, when it comes to realism and plausibility. Um, and, and to me, it's very encouraging. The, the other movie that I love is, is The Martian, you know, which I think does an incredible job of using real science to tell a fun story, you know, in a way that I think someone like Campbell would have really appreciated. And with with that, uh, because of something as as fun as quantum mania is, when you really think about it, and what Brian Greene is is doing with string theory and 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 quantum mechanics and and quantum physics, and then you tie that into a movie for entertainment. It, if, if anybody wants to jump down the rabbit hole and look into the science, they could see that the movie is not that far off from what science is trying to present to the public today, right? Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, and this is something that, you know, I, I've, one of the big reasons I love science fiction is that it is a catalyst for curiosity. You know, like you read some of these stories, and, um, you know, like uh, Isaac Asimov said that. You know, one measure, if you want to find the smart young kids, look for people that love good science fiction, okay, because they are the people who are going to follow up and, you know, want to learn more about these things and maybe become innovators and, and contribute, you know, like uh, as, as adults. Um, and I think, yeah, like if, if, if a science fiction has been good for anything, it's, it's been encouraging um, young people to, to think about these things in, in, in serious ways. Have you seen something strange in the sky that you can't explain? Um, no, um, I, I've I've often thought about what I would do if that happened, and I'm very open to the possibility. But it's never it's never happened, and and, and uh, yeah, I, I I I'm not sure exactly how it would change my life, but I, I I thought about this a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a life changing experience. It it, it truly is. Um, well, you know, I mean, I, I will say one, one quick thing is that, um, you know, my generation, I talk about Heinlein and, and you know, Kazimov. Um, these, these are writers I actually discovered later on. The, 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 the stuff that I loved growing up were things like the X-Files. You know, the X-Files for me was kind of my big entry point into science fiction. It definitely like shaped my tastes and my interests, you know, much more than a lot of the writers I've been talking about. Uh, you know, the X-Files is a documentary right <laughs> you know that right <laughs> that, is well, not, that is not that is not uh, it's not fiction well okay it's so not here, fiction here's, here's 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 my take on that okay one of the best things that science fiction can do is to make us wonder if the world is different from what, what it seems to be okay um which is actually very different from the kind of science fiction that you associate with um you know uh like campbell even though you know he had some weird interests you know but people like van vote like um like dick you know uh going back to the 30s uh you know writers like charles fort they, they ask us you know like what if we're, we're not you know entirely rational or, or what if the world can't be explained you know entirely with with rational thinking and to me that is an incredibly evocative question right and i think it's one of the best things that science fiction and fantasy can do is to force us to think, you know, what if we're just, you know, what, what if you know way less about the world than we, than we think we do? You know, Fort was really close to her religion. <laughs> he was really close, man. And I'm to a have, huge Charles Ford fan. Yeah, me, no, me, I, too. I, me too. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Me too. To have a genre, a lifestyle named after you, that's a big deal. 
Yeah. Right? Go back and read those books, which I read. Oh, you know, I, have, I, have, I have. I and, have. I have. I um, have. You know, and they're, they're incredible. You know, and so, so for people that know, don't know, you know, Charles Fort is this guy in New York in the 30s and, and, you know, earlier who was going through old newspapers and finding accounts of, you know, events like frogs falling from the sky and unexplained winged shapes and this and you know like spacecraft and and you know saying these this, this is data this is information you know this is not from some fringe publication this is from the new york times um and saying here here are like a hundred examples of things that we can't explain um and again like he he kind of proposes some explanations maybe a little bit tongue-in-cheek but it, the, the effect is really just to make you question things it, it's really to, to question you know kind of how how useful can the scientific method be, you know, when faced with uh, a world as, as strange as the one, you know, ours is? Yeah. I, I, what an honor, you know, to have somebody go up to somebody else and go, hey, man, are you a 40? I am, dude. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> no, I, I love it. I love it. I, yeah, I, yeah. One, one, of my, yeah. one of my secret missions in life is to, is to um, bring Charles Ford to as many people as, as I can. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And now let's stay. Let's let's go back in time a little bit and talk about. Oh, by the way, if you want to see something strange in the sky, just come hang out with me. Okay, guaranteed. Gary, I'm, I'm telling you, you will bend over, put your hands on your knees, shake your head, and go, "Oh man, like okay, this stuff is real." It, it, it's 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 strange because that's what I did. As a matter of fact, the first time I saw something move, I was with a group of people. I begged for a Vicodin and a shot of vodka <laughs> right on the spot. And I don't do either, but I needed it then. It was like, it was crazy. It was crazy. I didn't even know what to do. I thought, do I go on the air? You know, at the time, Alec, I'm hosting Coast to Coast. I've got this. I've got my TV show on History Channel, right? All going on at the same time. I've got a lot of influence. I speak for the community. Now, what do I do with this? Do I go public with it or not? Because if I go public with it, I become part of the story. Right. And I didn't, you know what I mean? Do I want to stay out of the story and just continue to be an objective host? Or do I support the people that just saw this with me? You know, so I chose to, I went public. Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was, it was truly a, a strange moment, which takes me back to tying into today with something like childhood's end. Because when that was written, and you think about it, the world's reaction to first contact and 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 how that interaction would go down and how we would deal with it as a planet and then it, it which and it was so well done it was so well written short story too short short yeah considering how complex it is um and then you fast forward to today and this alien reality which is all over television and the news and 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 state actors and governments around the world all talking about this subject and the world didn't implode is that because science fiction has been slowly prepping us for it with stories like childhood's end mm -hmm. well you know i mean th 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 that's a good question um childhood's end is a good story because it's about the end of the human race Right and kind of what that would that would feel like in practice. And again, it's another Clark story that um, you know is almost insanely ambitious. Um, I mean, my favorite detail about Childhood's End is that um, you know the I mean I haven't read it in a long time, but you know so these extraterrestrials appear and they don't show themselves for a long time, and when they finally do, they look like devils. They look like demons. Um, and, and, you know, people are freaking out, like, what, why do these people, why do these beings have horns and, and wings? And it's because subconsciously we know that when they arrive, that's the end of us, that that's the end of, you know, the human species. And so we have this like collective unconscious, you know, aversion to that, um, that image, right? Cause we know what it means. You know, we, we know that, you know, when these beings appear, that's it. Um, and to me, that's such a powerful idea that I've, I've never gotten over it. 
Why, why, why did you take uh, that turn with it? What, what do you mean? Uh, to accept it that way, um, that that would be the end. And that is a preconceived notion of what an alien species may be. Well, I mean, I think that's kind of the, uh, I mean, I, I'm just speaking about the the story, right? I think that's the premise right. of the story, which is that, um, you know, we, 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 we are afraid of the devil. We are afraid of demons because we know, and I don't, I, Mm, yeah we seriously froze there that was the that was the 30 second freeze oh oh no i'm sorry yeah um so um Uh, yeah you you were talking about uh uh uh, angels and demons and the and the image of it yeah yeah so so what i like about childhood's end is that you know it, it is in some ways a hopeful story right because mankind is is being prepared for the next stage. But to, you know, the human race that has built, you know, its own civilization, it feels like death. It feels like the end. You know, it's actually the beginning of something better. But the way we um, react naturally, you know, to these like traumatic crisis moments that will lead to, to you know, the, the next phase, it, it feels like the, the end of the world. It, it feels like something scary and apocalyptic even if um you know the the long-term picture is, is a positive one well and there's that part and then you have the uh the impact of you know the ship arriving and the way that the world uh reacted to it and there was a pretty negative approach to it where um i forget his name right now um the, the alien, I forget his name, it just escapes me, had to yeah. calm everybody down, and he had to do that through an ambassador, obviously because of his his look, and he didn't want to freak out people further, and, and so there was that. But what I'm suggesting here is that the movie and other, the movie, the book, the science fiction story, and there's been so much of it in pop culture that if a ship did show up above Los Angeles or Chicago or New York, I don't think there's going to be that kind of freak out. Um, and that's that's the part that I'm very impressed with the planet right now. We're seem, we seem to be handling the news pretty well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the jury is still out. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how good we are in reality when it comes down to it at, at handling um, moments of traumatic change um but we'll see yeah Karellen, that was his name that's right yeah Karellen. see i i've got a smart audience they 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 keep me um on my toes now um the the other part about uh this and i know that you've thought about this a lot science fiction has been overcoming the vastness of space with faster than light travel or instantaneous travel. And and I would also like to talk about uh, the original series too of Star Trek um, uh, because of this and warp drives. How do you think ET is, is moving around space? Well, you know, I, I, okay. So here, here's my take on, on, um, I don't think faster than light travel exists. Um, and I and, and don't 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 get me wrong here. I, I don't think that what people experience as um, alien encounters reflects literal extraterrestrial contact. I, I don't think there is a intelligence in our galaxy that is coming to visit us. Um, are there other things going on that might look that way? Maybe. All right. But I'm much more inclined to think that we are experiencing something that is um, so far outside our um, conception of reality that we map these images onto it. You know, the, the current myth is one of UFOs and extraterrestrial encounters. But, you know, um, as you say in the Bible, angel visitations, um, 
visionary experiences of other kinds, mystical experiences, you know, I, things are, are what's, what's happening and that the, and you might disagree, um, but that the um, sort of the, the alien, um, you know, from like the visitor from another planet um, myth is the one that is currently dominant. I don't know how you feel. It's about not, that. Yeah. Uh, myth is the wrong word. Okay. Experience is the right word. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'll, 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 I'll give you that point. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, it's the you know. experience. And it, and the reason for that, if you take, uh, I'll give you two examples. And if you yourself had witnessed, right, or experienced what I'm about to tell you, then myth would not be the word you're using. Trust okay. me. And first off is David Fravor. And David Fravor, the Navy pilot who has come forward from the Nimitz and discussed what happened with him and the Tic Tac and his wing person, Alex Dietrich, and and the Nimitz battle group, uh, aircraft carrier, and the uh, the the Princeton, which is uh, a flight control and missile and communications radar uh, cruiser. This object went from eighty five thousand feet to sea level in less than one second. And it happened a bunch of times when it was tracked on radar. So then they they sent out the F-A-18s, and uh, uh, Captain Fravor is the leader of the squadron, the Black Aces. So he goes out, and they go to the cap point where this object is, and they see it. And it's a large white Tic Tac-shaped object uh, sitting... Uh, at sea level and then it chases and they go in a circle and they're chasing each other and then it darts off and disappears so now that is not myth this is an actual event that actually happened and captured on video so it, it's it's that you have that event and then I'll give you a personal one. Up in Washington, I'm with 30 people. I'm with 400, but 30 of us are together at this picnic table. And we're looking at Mount Adams. No, I was looking at Mount Adams. Everybody else is off doing their thing. And I'm sitting at a picnic table uh, with some friends. I've got some binoculars. And I'm looking at Mount Adams, which is 14 miles away. Through the banana, I'm looking at birds, just looking at the nature. And all of a sudden, when you least expect it, from behind the mountain, here's the mountain, from behind the mountain, pops, it's 14 miles away, is this, I'm going to guess and say four to 500 foot tall black beer can. And it's spinning like this and it's going across the sky and it's got a silver top silver bottom like a loom I, I don't know but top and bottom and it's spinning like this and i can see that it's spinning because there's a circle on one side silver and i can see that and it's perfect in the sun it's in focus and i'm like what and i start i stand up and i scream video 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 pictures and i come back and everybody sees it and they're looking at it i'm looking at it with my naked eye it's just a little spinning thing 14 miles away. And I look back in the binoculars and I look at it. Perfect. And it's just this, it's huge. And it's just spinning like this going across the sky. And I thought it's three o'clock in the afternoon, razor focused. It was perfect. Sun coming down off of it. I thought we were going to see this Alec for a couple hours. It was moving so slow going across the sky. And as I come off the binoculars and I'm looking at it with my naked eye and I come back, as I come back, this is 15 seconds. That's it. The guy sitting next to me, Steve, says it phased out. What? And I go back to the binoculars and it's gone. It just 
disappeared. It was gone. I couldn't believe it. This giant object. Now, I don't know if it's aliens. I don't know if it's us. I don't know what it was. But it was the craziest thing I have ever seen. And I, I, I can't explain it. I wish I would have seen it disappear. I, I, you know, I didn't see it appear. I only saw it come out from behind the mountain. So I don't know how it appeared. If it phased in, I don't know. But uh, it definitely just went gone. Now, that somebody explained that to me. But that's not myth. I'm telling you, that was our experience and we all saw it. And I got a pretty crazy video, too. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, with. I mean, I I um I, I will I will rephrase slightly. You know, I think myth might be the wrong word um, because you know I don't discount that people have these experiences, um, but I I don't know. I I, I just feel like you know um, I, I'm very influenced by Robert Anton Wilson, who was someone I read when I was uh, you know a, a teenager, had a big influence on me. Who um, you know was agnostic. All right. And he says, you know, there are some strange things happening. Um, some people frame them as visitations by other species, let's say. Um, you can also see them using the language of, you know, mystical experiences. And um, I find it hard to believe that the issue has been decided. You know, I, I think even if, the, if these experiences have like objective um, truth to them, that their nature, you know, it's very hard to to um, conclude anything at this stage about what those those things might mean. Well, see, but that's 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 the journey, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I I don't know what I saw. I don't I don't have those answers. But it certainly forces me to go chase down the knowledge. And, and it goes, and, and I, and, yeah. And, and I speak as someone who has not had that experience firsthand. I, I'm but, speaking as someone who has, has thought about it and read about it and, you know, like sp spent, you know, like years of my life thinking about these things, you know, and, and, and kind of what they imply about what we understand about the world. If I had seen it my, myself, you know, my reaction, my, my convictions might be very different. Well, it's fun. That's yeah. the other thing, and, and I'll tell you fun. why. Yeah, because it, at the beginning of the show, you said something very, very profound, that these authors started the conversation about the world is not what we are told, right? Yeah. And that's exactly it, because when you go and you see something like that, it's like, well, I don't know, but I can yeah. tell you what they've been telling us is bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, excuse yeah. me. I don't, no, I don't, I don't swear on the show, but yeah, no, I, I, I totally understand. And, and that is, that is a huge, uh, you know, like realization, you know, the idea, I mean, this is why the X-Files was so important to me growing up, you know, the idea that maybe the, the story you've been told about how the world works is a lie, you know, and that it's a lie that has been put in place for a reason, you know, that the narrative about your country or, you know, your culture is something that someone invented. You know, and the truth is stranger and more complicated than, you know, anything that you were taught in school. I think that's something that, you know, like um, science fiction especially has has taught me to, to, to believe. And uh, the other part uh, with this, because uh, the faster than light conversation or the extra dimensions, you know, uh, we've got four dimensions. We used to have three. Einstein comes along. Now we can add space time to that. So we've got we've got four dimensions. And now physics is talking about uh, 11 dimensions at least, mm -hmm. right? And uh, that faster than light travel is now a conversation that has had it's 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 a thought experiment and a general topic of conversation amongst physicists today. It's yeah. like everybody is really, really, really looking at this when it used to be, yeah. you know, light is is constant and that's it. That there's nothing else to discuss here. But we've certainly moved uh, far beyond that. Yeah. I mean, the thing about faster than light travel, it, it, to me, it kind of falls in the same category as the singularity will give us life extension. You know, these are all things we want to be true. 
you know, we want to believe that we will, we can live forever if we choose to, or that we can travel to other, you know, like stars within a human lifetime if we want to, you know, and, and so I, I, I also want to believe these things are possible. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I'm very skeptical because there is like an element of wishful thinking. Anytime you want the answer to be a certain way, you have to be very cautious about accepting arguments that, you know, think it, it could be true. Well, okay. So I, I mentioned at the beginning H.G. Wells and the time that's machine. That's how I feel. You know, no, that's, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, at the beginning Crap of the show. Times. Okay. Uh, we're overlapping now. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, well, I mean, you know, when I say if you're careful, I'm, I'm talking about myself, right? I, I'm someone who has learned to be very cautious about um, looking for evidence that supports something that I want to be true. Right, and I think this is true of, of, of all of us, and it's true of scientists. I, I, I think scientists, um, you know, they aren't always objective. They, they they are people with ambitions and with desires who sometimes, you know, will um, interpret the facts in ways that are uh, beneficial to them. Right, that may not be ent entirely in line with the objective evaluation of the evidence. Well, that's because I don't know about you. But I can't read physics algorithms. Right. Can you? Can you? Can you read them and 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 interpret? Probably no, not. I um, I'm I'm currently right. writing a book about a physicist and um, you know, Louis, uh, Louis Alvarez, and I'm relieved that he was mostly an experimentalist. He built stuff, you know, that stuff I can understand. Uh, he was not a theorist, and, and and so I've been able to avoid having to to you know try to um, unpack some of that stuff. Yeah, because we are subjected to a physicist description of what they feel the numbers support. You and I can't read it. It's not English, right? right. <laughs> so, therefore, they can uh, paint the picture that they want extrapolated out of it. And, right. and we wouldn't know, we wouldn't know any difference because we can't. It's it's a completely foreign language to us. Yeah, and you know I've spent a lot of time thinking about you know theory versus experiment, right? And you can you can prove a lot of things on paper, but um, you have to actually go out into the lab and like find the evidence that supports you know those, those ideas, or else it's just moving numbers around. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so what I was uh, 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 going towards is. I brought up H.G. Wells and the Time Machine in the beginning of the show. And time travel, again, using the word romantic, and I've just used it twice in a show, uh, shame on me. But time travel is like the most romantic thing there is, right? To go back and correct things or to go to the future and see how we ended up or whatever it may be. But that's why it resonated uh, with such a large audience. And today, it is still one of the most hotly debated subject uh, there is, right? Time travel. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I always say, you know, um, people ask, you know, what's the difference between uh, science fiction and fantasy? And I say that, you know, fantasy are things that could never happen. And science fiction are things that aren't currently true, uh, but could happen, uh, plus time travel. Okay, because I don't know if time travel is possible. It, it falls in that category of things that we want to be true. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to me how that idea is so compelling that it's kind of been grandfathered into hard science fiction, which otherwise is pretty good about uh, trying to follow the laws of physics. But um, they, they, they essentially said that we'll have time travel if, if the story demands it. Oh, well, traveling to the future, we, we're doing it right now. That's true. And, and you know, okay. time dilation yeah. is, is real, right? Like, yeah. like that, yeah. I believe. Time travel to the past is, is a different question. It, that's, a, that's a difficult... It's And see, that again, I mean, I don't even know if I went to the past, and I would like to go and observe. I would like to see things, not be a participant. I would like to see how the Great Pyramid was built. Yeah, I would like. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to get that answer because nobody knows, right? Yeah, I'd like. To, I'd like to do that. Uh, and there's a few other moments in history I would like to go back and witness, but not be a participant. And maybe that's a way of considering time travel to the past 
is doing it as an observer, figuring out a way to to see what what has been captured in in the ether. You know, yeah. maybe those events have been uh, documented uh, uh, forever. Well, one of my favorite science fiction short stories, probably my, one of my top ten stories. It's it's called Vintage Season. Um, by uh, Henry Kuttner and Catherine Moore. Um, and it's about tourists. It's about people who travel back in time to witness disasters, you know, like famous catastrophes. But, you know, they don't intervene. They have to, you know, stand back and, and you know, watch, um, you know, without actually uh, affecting what happens. That's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Would you do it? Um, I mean, yeah. if, you, if, if you had the opportunity... I mean, absolutely. There, there, there are all kinds of things. I mean, I'm, I'm a writer. I've ended up writing um, biography and history. And so absolutely, you know, there, there are things where even small things, you know, where I don't know exactly what happened, you know, in a room or in, in, a, in, a, in a conversation. And yeah, I, I would love to go back and see some of those things firsthand in a way that is... Yeah, give um, me an you example. Know, you, 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 recreate it with letters and documents um, and diaries. But, you know, I mean, it, it's it's all... You know, th th there are so many things that I know I've, I've missed. You know that I, I would only that, that I would know in a second if I if I went back there. You know, and saw these things firsthand. Uh, give me an example of where you would like to uh, go back and check out. Wow. Well, you know, I mean, I um, this is this is just on my mind. Um, so I'm writing a book about Luis Alvarez, who is a physicist who worked on, on the Manhattan Project, and um, you know. You can write about the Manhattan Project, and clearly everyone who worked on it left a memoir, and, uh, you know, there's tons of documentary evidence about it. But to have lived through that moment, not knowing what was going to happen, you know, to to... <laughs> To, to, to be in be there and not know whether your years of effort were going to result in a bomb that worked and then have it come down to one test in the desert um it's it's kind of incomprehensible that like that whole story to us it's so you know it, now it seems inevitable that the bomb worked and that you know things happened the way they did but um to, to have that uncertainty to not know what the future was going to look like um and being a part of that that project to me is just very hard to get my head around I can't imagine the. I, I went through a really uh, about uh, two years ago before Oppenheimer, before all of this. I went through maybe three years ago a pretty serious Oppenheimer rabbit hole, and it happened to me because of a very old TV show, TV series, two seasons called Manhattan. Did you see it? Sorry, which which uh, uh, the TV series the TV series Manhattan? Okay, no, I haven't seen that one. Okay, it's too much better than the film Oppenheimer. Okay, much better, much better, really well done. And the series was from like two thousand and nine or two thousand and eight, mm -hmm. um, but I happened to, to catch it and binge it. So. I, I went back and, and read about the life of, of Oppenheimer and I got his autobiography and, and started to, to do this. And I got to tell you, that was a troubled guy. And the movie Oppenheimer yeah. uh, doesn't capture it. People think it does. No, no, it's much, 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 much more uh, complex uh, than, than the movie. But uh, the movie was good. I, I enjoyed it. But the the TV show Manhattan uh, definitely captures it uh, much better. But I agree with you. I would love to go back to New Mexico when it was nothing but trees and watch Los Alamos just blossom in a year, right? Because yeah. that, 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 if you think about it, that was done in two years. Yeah. No, it's, two it's years. Yeah. Well, you know, one, one thread, I've talked about Campbell – and I talked a little bit about Buckminster Fuller, you know, one interesting um, common thread there is that these guys who grew up and were, um, you know, around during World War II, they all kind of wish they'd been part of the Manhattan Project. You know, Campbell wished he'd been young enough to have been at MIT when, you know, like that started, when, when that program, you know, was, was ramping up. Because that's where you would be. If you were a technologist, a, a physicist during the war, you know, you you would have been part of that project. And um, Campbell and Fuller and some other folks, you know, they always regretted the fact that they 
were on the outside, you know, and they they would sometimes invent stories that made it sound like they'd had a bigger impact on, you know, the bomb than they they ever really did. I'm going to show you uh this is now check this out. You're gonna you're gonna flip out. This is my junior high school in Panama that I went to in 1977 and 1978. And so I go my first day of school and we're it's lunchtime and we're going to the cafeteria and we walk out and uh and I see it. And I went, that's the cafeteria? And they go, that's the Buckminster Fuller cafeteria. Wow. I was like, what? And here it is. There's the school. And that's nice. the cafe that's the cafeteria right there. Wow. Is that crazy? I, I love it. I love yeah. It. And that so I'm I'm 14. I go down the Buckminster rabbit hole, man. <laughs> no, I I mean I went through the same rabbit hole around the same time. Yeah. Yeah, crazy his influence. Um, most people, the the buckyball, right? Yeah. I used to do shows on the buckyball and uh, talk about a futurist and and the buckyball and and the geodesic dome and the influence of so many people that that he had. Buckminster was a, a very 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 deep dude. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, he, he was this, this, so I wrote a biography of him. That was the, the book I wrote after my story of science fiction, which, you know, to me, it was a natural progression. You know, Fuller, for a lot of people, was kind of the embodiment of that science fiction hero in the real world. You know, he was the, the, the gadgeteer. He was the technologist who, you know, invented these things that would make the world work for everyone. And, you know, and again, kind of a myth in some ways, but an incredibly interesting, inspiring figure. Um, absolutely. Would we have the geodesic dome today if it wasn't for uh, Buckminster? Not in the same way. Um, I mean, that design predates him. There, there, there were earlier domes that basically were, were built on those principles, but he was the one who kind of understood what it could do um, and popularized it and popularized the geometry and kind of preached the dome, you know, first to the military and then later to the hippies, you know, like it had a huge influence on the counterculture. And so, yeah, no, his charisma and his persona, you know, absolutely um, were what made the dome a success. Without him, it would be a, a, a footnote, I'm sure, in, in design history. Do you think that, uh, tell everybody what the buckyball is. I want, I want your definition. So it's a form of carbon that has 60, uh, 60 carbon atoms uh, in this. And the pattern of, uh, you know, uh, hexagons and pentagons is the same as a soccer ball. Um, but it is the most symmetrical molecule imaginable. It was the first new kind of uh, allotype of carbon discovered um, since uh, diamond and graphite. And, um, you know, it, it, it revolutionized chemistry. You know, it, it was like the, the first idea that we could build these things, these shapes in three dimensions, these like round, you know, uh, you know, sort of uh, three dimensional uh, nanotechnology, um, you know, structures that, again, haven't quite paid off in the way that, you know, people hoped they would. But who knows? I mean, it, it kind of was the, the, the idea that um, kind of got that entire industry going. And, and I think someday it's going to have an enormous impact on, on our lives. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Alec, fantastic show tonight, despite uh, the technical issues. And uh, But I look forward to our next conversation, and we will do it from your home studio for sure. Absolutely, yes. Uh, let's, let's make sure to do that next time. Yeah, thank you so much, Alec. Where can everybody chase you down and, and, and get your stuff? Well, I'm online. Just look me up. Um, my name is Alec Neville Ali, fairly distinctive. Um, my website is a little bit dormant at the moment, but my contact page is still there. So if people want to reach out, ask questions, um, I would love to hear from anyone. Thank you so much, Alec. Behave and be well. Thank you so much. Great. You're welcome. 
perfect show tonight. Alec Navala Lee and the history of science fiction. Again, I look forward to the next time that Alec is on the show. And yeah, we had some technical issues tonight, but the conversation was fantastic. And uh, let's see, what am I doing tomorrow night on the show? Does anybody know? Let me see. Let me see. What am I doing tomorrow night? Tomorrow night. Oh, Taji Amin is with us. Journalist, TV presenter, reporter. And he's got a new TV show out, and we're going to be talking about the high strangeness of UFO incidents in Puerto Rico and what has been going on down there with him. All of that tomorrow night on Fade to Black, so you're not going to want to miss that. And uh, there you go, and I'll see everybody tomorrow. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you, too. Bill, Jonaside, Dex, and Jessica. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this podcast is owned and copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black of the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Taji Amin, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.